And so in Philippians, uh, we're starting out in a great book tonight. A um, lot of great passages, a lot of great uh, well-known passages throughout the book of Philippians. And tonight, I'm um, probably just going to get through the first 11 verses. You know, this isn't a book I want to really rush through. I'm not in a rush to get through this. Just because there's so much good stuff in the book of Philippians. And, uh, you know, it's only four chapters long, so might as well stop <clears throat> and smell the roses while we're here in such a great book. But it, started out, it starts out there in cha- verse 1, it says, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are, in, are at Philippi, with the bishops and the deacons. And, you know, I would mention just real quick that that one verse right there shows us that there's a structure within the local church. You have the saints, you have the bishops, and you have the deacons. More about that in a later sermon on the house church that I'm planning on preaching down the road, but it's worth pointing out while we're, while we're there. But if you look there in verse 2, it says, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. And really, uh, what I would entitle this sermon tonight is Fellowship in the Gospel. And we see that when we have fellowship with one another, we have fellowship with the brethren, that there's a lot of joy that comes through that fellowship, that there's a lot of joy that comes from fellowship. You see it here with Paul. Uh, with Paul here, he's, he, you could just see that the joy that he's expressing towards the Philippian people. In fact, when we get into the book here, you'll notice that theme, how much there's just a lot of love and joy being spoken about on, on Paul on the part of the Philippians, that they've brought a lot of love and joy into his life. And it says there, uh, of course, the verse 5, for your fellowship in the gospel from this first day until now. So we see that having fellowship, at least for Paul, this was the case, uh, having fellowship through the gospel is a source of sincere joy in his life. And, you know, that should be the same for us. You know, we should have a sense of joy through the fact that we have fellowship one with another through the gospel. Meaning, you know, because we're saved, because we have brothers and sisters in Christ, that should be a source of joy to us. And if it's not, something's wrong, okay? We're missing something, okay? Paul is looking at this and saying, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. I mean, can we say that about everyone we think about at church? We thank God for them, or do we think, we think about somebody at church or a brother or sister in Christ and just say, well, I wish I could stop thinking about that person. <laughs> or maybe we think something we wouldn't want them to know we think about them, right? That's not the case with Paul. Paul says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always at every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy. So when he's praying for God to God for the Philippian people, he's doing it with joy. You know, he's praying, and we'll see specifically here towards the end what he, with the, 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 the substance of his prayer but again, is that how we would pray for one another? You know, do we pray when so-and-so is sick and just say, well, Lord, if you could just keep them out a little longer. Don't kill them, you know, but if you could just, this Sunday, I'm not in a good mood, you know what I mean? You, we ought to be praying for one another, and there should be joy there. There should be a thankfulness. We should have joy in our fellowship. You know, fellowship is a great source of joy. And we can say, you know, I love, I love the brethren. They're a great joy to me, but it's like... Well, where are you? <laughs> if you love us so much, why aren't you here? <laughs> kind of a thing. Now, uh, if you're forsaking the fellowship, you know, of other saved believers, you know, you're forsaking joy. You know, we want people to come and be here at church for their sake. You know, we want them to come and get the joy and the peace and the fellowship that we can have in the gospel with our brethren. You got to come to where the people are for that. And this is where we are. You know, I know we fellowship outside of church and things like that, but, you know, Sunday morning, Sunday night, this is where, and, and Thursday night, this is where the fellowship in the gospel is taking place. And that, that means this, that coming here should be a great source of joy. And, you know, I don't know how many times in my own Christian life I've, I've gone to church with a bad mood, you know, gone to church, had a rough day, rough week, whatever, and I've gone into church, got to talk to the brethren, got to hear the preaching of God's word, got to sing some songs, even if they were a little rough in the beginning, <laughs> and walked out with a smile on my face and had joy in my heart. You know, why? Because I had fellowship in the gospel. <clears throat> that's something we should thank God for. Go over, uh, keep something, of course, in Philippians, we'll be there again, but go over to John 13, John chapter 13. You know, we are commanded to love the brotherhood. The Bible says in 1 Peter, honor all men, 
Love the brotherhood, fear God. I mean, when you're, when you're putting something on the, in the same sentence, in the same breath with fear God, that's pretty important. You know, if you say, well, fearing God's not that important, no one would say that. But hey, it's love the brotherhood, fear God. Right? So it tells me that loving the brotherhood is a pretty important thing. Loving the brethren is a pretty important thing. We should probably do that. And then you know what? If we did it and we showed up where, the, where God's people were and got the fellowship in the gospel, we'd have some more joy in our life. And maybe, maybe the reason we're, we don't have the joy that, that we were looking for is because we're not getting it from its source, from God's people, from fellowship in the gospel. I mean, can we say we love people we don't fellowship with? Can we say we love people we don't fellowship with? And the answer is no. I mean, try that in, in a marriage. You know, would your spouse believe you if you loved them, if you avoided them? Maybe your spouse would have loved it if you avoided them. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But you know what? You can't say, oh, I love you, honey. Really? Because I haven't seen you more than, you know, you show up and you eat and you leave. You know, you throw some laundry on the floor and then you say, see you, see you tonight. You know, you come home late, you leave early. You don't call, you don't text, but yeah, but I love you. Well, I believe you, but boy, I believe it'd be a lot easier to believe you if we had some fellowship, you know, if you, if you spent some time with me, right? Same thing with the brother, the brother, the brotherhood, you know, can you say we love the brotherhood? We love the brethren if we're avoiding church. Everybody's like, yeah, I'll get there when I can, when it's easy, when it's convenient. That's not love. You know, there's something missing there. And you know what? The people that are here are going to have the joy. The people that are here, they're going to have the fellowship. We're just going to have it without you. Now, if you can hear me, obviously you're here, right? But the people that aren't here, you know, they're the ones that are missing out. The Bible says there in John 13, verse 34, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. That's a commandment. And that's how he starts it out. This, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, as I have loved you. I mean, think about how Jesus loved us. Is that how we're loving one another? Being patient, kind, compassionate? Or do we just, we get angry so quick sometimes at people. People get into just the dumbest arguments over the dumbest things and just stay angry and just get bitter and mad. And then enough time goes by, they can't even remember why they hate that person. I can't remember why I'm mad at them. I remember we had an argument on Facebook or something years ago, and ever since then, I just can't stand their face. Well, that's real Christ-like. Good luck, you know, you're really keeping that new commandment up real well, aren't you? You know, and it's important. Why? Because it says in verse 35, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. By what shall all men know that we are his disciples? If we love one another. And people come into church and it's just cold and everyone's just, no one's smiling and it's not very much fun. And visitors come and, boy, what's going on in that church? No joy there. You sure these are Christians? Christian life looks like a drag to me. No thanks. I'll go down to the, the fun center. Where they, you know, I, I, maybe I won't get any Bible down there, but at least the, they got the nice lights, and they got the fog machine, and, the, and they got the, the fancy, you know, they got all the instrumentation up there, and they're rocking out for Jesus. I might not learn anything. In fact, you won't. Very little, if you're lucky. But everyone's happy. Everyone's walking around, you know, to the point where it almost makes you sick sometimes. <laughs> been most church. It's like, get real, man. <laughs> but look, it shouldn't be said of that in, in, in this church, in our church. Why? Because we have the truth. You know, we have Christ. We have fellowship in the gospel. And we have, uh, you know, something to be happy about. Go over to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Well, I guess I'll love my brother if I have to, if I'm commanded to. After all, I wouldn't want to break the commandments. So I'll go ahead and love you, brother. <laughs> you know, it's a sincere joy. It comes from sincere love of the brotherhood. And, you know, sometimes it is something we got to grow into. But letting things go, you know, forgive and forget, being patient and kind with people, so on and so forth. Look at John chapter 15, verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. 
These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. We'd say, boy, I'd love to have his joy in me. Boy, I'd love to have my joy be full tonight. I mean, isn't that what we're looking for? I mean, life's hard enough. I mean, and I get it. Life's not always, a, you know, the, isn't always easy. You know, it's not a, I'm trying to think of a, a saying, but no one's not, I want to say box of chocolates, but <laughs> I've made myself look dumb enough <laughs> recently. <laughs> right? But life's not like that. Life's not always a, a bed of roses, right? But all the more reason to get some joy. I'd love to have that. I'd love to have that joy remaining in me. I'd love it to be full. Well, verse 12, this is the, my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. <clears throat> Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Well, I'm the friend of Jesus. Okay, great. Do you love the brotherhood? And again, if, if, if you love the brotherhood, you'd want to be around them. You'd want to be where they are. You'd want to participate in what they're doing and spend time and, and share those experiences and so on and so forth. So Jesus, you know, the things that he spoke, the things that he commanded, they are a source of joy to us. And what did he speak? What did he command? He told us to love each other. I and mean, he told us to love each other to the point of death. That's pretty serious. You know, love, you know, you know lo even as I have loved you, no greater love hath it, no uh, no love uh, excuse me greater love hath no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends and that's exactly what he did for us. I mean that's the extent to which we should love the brotherhood. I don't know that any will will ever have opportunity to demonstrate that, you know, and we never really will know if we were put in that position. I could say yeah I'd, I'd step in front of a, a you know speeding truck for you or speeding load I'll catch a bullet for you until that, you know, really happens. But I could tell you what, the guy that's not coming around, the guy that doesn't want the fellowship in the gospel, he's not going to lay down his life for the brethren. He can't even live his life for the brethren. <clears throat> and he told us, Jesus, if you want that joy, you want it to be full, you know what? You got to love the brethren. You got to be where the brethren are. Go over to 1 John. Keep something John 15. So go over to 1 John 3. 1 John 3. These aren't new passages. These aren't anything new I'm telling you tonight. But it's important. It's really important. You know, the Bible talks a lot about loving the brotherhood. Loving the brethren. The Bible says in 1 John 3, verse 16, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, we ought, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? You know, if our brother, brother comes to us and says, hey, you know, I'm struggling here. Well, I don't know, maybe a brother might come to you in a matter of weeks even and say, it's, hey, I'm moving. You know? <laughs> Could you help me out? <laughs> oh, I'm real busy that weekend. Uh, and I get it. Sometimes we are busy that weekend, right? But if we shut up our bowels of compassion, what about when they're in a real need? I remember I had to call, I, I, I remember once, Hey, you know, let me just bring it down to a more practical level. You know, I'm talking about, you know, Jesus saying you got to lay down your life, right? That might never happen. We might never have to even have to be put in a position where that's even something we would have to think about doing. But, you know, just on a more, you know, basic level, some real world application tonight, you know, what if, what if we just have a, a basic general need in life and we call up a brother, hey, can you help me out with this? I remember when we were first got married, we were living way out, 45 minutes out of town, 45 minutes, an hour away, out in the sticks. And my, uh, my, my battery was dead. I don't know what happened. I just went dead. It's just like, batteries never go dead. Yes, they do, right? I, I didn't have jumper cables. It was, I had to get to work. It was like 4 or 5 in the morning, and I had to get to work, like an hour away. You know, and I, I called a brother. <laughs> I said, brother, I hate to do this. I knocked on the neighbor's door and nobody else got up. Can you come give me a jump? Didn't even think twice about it. Didn't even think twice about it. I said, I'm sorry about that. He said, don't worry. Glad to do it. You know, 
That, that's the love of the brotherhood right there. That's kind of, you know, that's a little bit more practical thing. You know, when our brothers ask us something, you know, when our, when our brothers and sisters in Christ ask a favor of us, it's just like, oh, I'll do it. Because I, ha- well, I mean, come on, you know, you heard the preacher. I have to. I'm commanded to. Well, don't expect to get any joy out of that. Don't expect to get any joy at all. You know, it's, it's nice to help the brothers out, isn't it? It's nice to help out brothers and sisters in Christ. We get joy from that. Our joy is full. Now, uh, again, I hope you kept some of John 15, but let's go back to Philippians. Or, I'm sorry, no, nope, nope, nope. Stay where you are. We're going to keep going here. He's saying here in verses 16 and 17, you know, hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. And verse 17, whoso hath his world's good, this world's good and hath, seeth his brother have need of him and shutteth up his bowels from compassion from him, how dwelleth the lot of love of God in him? Look, verses 16 and 17, these are not isolated verses. You know, this, this is in the context of 1 John 3. He goes on and says in verse 18, My little children, let us not love in word and neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. You can't just say, I love the brotherhood. You can't just say, I love the brethren. You know, you have to perform. You have to prove that through, through your deeds. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, again, what's he talking about here? Loving the brotherhood. Look, and if our hearts condemn us, he hasn't, he hasn't shifted gears. He's not talking about something different. He's talking about loving the brotherhood. And he says, and if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. You say, boy, I just don't feel like I love the, my, the, the brotherhood. I don't feel like I'm, I'm loving my brothers and sisters in Christ. And God's saying, yeah, I know. And you know, the fact that you're condemned should just you know, wake you up to the fact that God knows that too about anything, you know, any sin in our life. But he's talking about loving the brotherhood particularly here. And he says, and hereby we know that we are the truth and shall assure our hearts before God. I mean, that's, that's quite the statement. We're going we're gonna, if to, we, if we love not in word, but neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth, that hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before God. How are you going to know you're of the truth tonight? How are you going to assure yourself that, that you are, or assure your hearts before him? By loving, not in word, but in deed and in truth. So it sounds like loving the brotherhood is pretty important, isn't it? And it sounds like we get a lot out of it. The lot hinges on it, doesn't it? Our assuring our hearts before him. Knowing that we are of the truth. It goes on in verse 20, Beloved, if a heart condemn us, then we have confidence toward God. Condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments. And what are his commandments? Love the brethren. And do those things that are pleasing in his sight. You know what pleases God when he sees brethren dwelling together in unity. He says it's a good thing. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave commandment. So again, our confidence to ask and the promise to receive. That's what we see here, right? Verse 21 of 22. He says, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have the confidence, we have confidence toward God, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Because we keep his commandments and do those things which are pleasing in his sight. <clears throat> Much hinges upon the love of, of the brethren tonight. Much hinges upon it. Your confidence to ask and know that you're going to receive things from God hinges on whether or not you love the brother. In truth and in deed. <clears throat> How about our assurance that we abide in him and he in us? That also hinges, the fact that we abide in him and he in us, hinges on the fact of whether or not we love the brethren in deed and in truth. So, you know, you can see how Philippians here is, is just a great book. I mean, just a few, few words out of Paul here, and, it, and there's just so much there. And he's showing us just in the f- first few verses, that, you know, that, that there is much joy to be found in praying for and fellowshipping with the brethren. And that if we fail to love the brethren, it's to our detriment. Say, well, I'm not going to love my brother, you know, and, and, and I, I get it. He's out of brother. 
I get it, you know, he's not going to, you know, we're not going to have that fellowship and, you know, I'm not going to come jump his car. You know, I'm not going to come help him, whatever. You know, I'm not going to love my brother in deed and truth. And I get it. It's going to cost him something. No, it's going to cost us something. It's going to cost us a whole lot more than whatever favor or whatever need we had or whatever that they had, rather. It's going to cost us a lot more than whatever they were asking. If you get what I'm saying. It's going to ask us this confidence to ask and receive. It's going, to ask, it's going to cost us our assurance that we abide in. It's going to cost us joy, his joy in us. It's to our determine, uh, detriment to not love the brethren. And, you know, it all comes back to church, doesn't it? It all comes back to church. If you love the brethren, you'll be in church. You see, show me somebody who's not in church. I'll show you somebody who doesn't love the brethren. And I don't care if it's new IFB. I don't care if it's old IFB. It's brothers in Christ that matter. Okay? And I'm just, and I'm kind of getting something off my chest a little bit. I'm just tired of just getting these emails from people. Well, I'd go there, but, you know, the pastor doesn't believe in the post-trib pre-wrath rapture. Well, are there brethren there? You think you might know of some, something else you don't that you might be able to learn from him? Then go. And be a blessing. And love the brethren in deed and in truth. And get some joy in your life. I don't, you know, I'm preaching the choir now. But let's move on here in Philippians chapter uh, 1. Philippians chapter 1. He goes on and says in Philippians chapter number 1, verse 3. And I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident in this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. A great verse about the fact that we're sealed in the day of our redemption, verse 6. It's another sermon. It goes on in verse 7. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as in the view... Inasmuch as both in my bonds and in defense and the confirmation of the gospel, you're all partakers of my grace. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. So this is a, this is a very wordy uh, group of verses here. In fact, you know, verses 3 through, I think, 7, you know, just looking at it, are all one sentence. So you got to kind of really slow down and, and, and think about what Paul is saying here. And he says there in verse 7, even as it is meet for me to think of this of you, because I have, conf- I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and my defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are all partakers of my, cra- of my grace. So he says, inasmuch, what Paul is saying here in, 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 in uh, beginning in verse 6 is that it was proper, right? It was meet. Or excuse me, verse seven. Even as it was, as it is meet for me to think this of all you, he's saying it's proper, it's fitting for Paul to be confident, right, that God would continue to work in the lives of the Philippians. That's what he's saying. Because remember, verse six, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. He's saying he's confident that God is going to continue to work in the lives of the Philippians. And he goes on and explains himself. It goes on and says in verse 7, even as it is meet, it's proper, it's fitting for me to think this, it's proper for me to think that God is going to continue to work in your life. Why? Because I have you in my heart. That's what Paul's saying. He's saying, look, I know God's going to continue to work in your heart, and it's meet for me to think that because I have you in my heart. He knows God's going to keep working and perform that work until the day of Jesus Christ because Paul has them in his heart. He says, in as much as, in as much as is uh, is a phrase that we don't use, right? It's conjunction that means in the view of the fact that, or seeing that sense, right? I have you in in, in my heart, and he's going on with this thought of the fact that he is confident in them because he has them in the heart, and he goes on and says, in as much, he's, he's confident in as much that both in my bonds and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel, you're all partakers of my grace. So why is Paul so confident that the Philippians 
are going, that, that God is going to continue to work unto the day of Jesus Christ in the Philippians. They, he, they are going to, uh, uh, perf- he's going to perform that work. Why is he so confident of that? Well, it's because he has them in his heart. And it's because of the fact that they are all partakers of his grace. <clears throat> For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. So he's starting out here and he's saying, how much he prays for them. He thanks God upon every remembrance of them. He's making requests for them in joy and that he's confident because of the fact that he's praying for them because of the fact that in verse 8 that God is his record that he has longed for them in the bowels of Jesus Christ. That is what's giving him that confidence that they are going to continue, that God is going to continue to work in their life because he's praying for them because he loves them. Because he has them in their heart, his heart, and because of the fact that they are partakers of his grace. Now, what is his grace? That he's praying for them. That he's praying for them. It's a very gracious thing for somebody to pray for you, isn't it? And we should pray for one another. You know, that would be loving the brother, brotherhood. <clears throat> so we need to look at this from Paul and the Philippians' perspective. What does this mean? it's a great thing from the Philippians perspective, when we understand what's being said here, that the confidence that Paul has comes from the fact that he has them in his heart and that he longs for them in the bowels of Jesus Christ and that they are partakers of his grace. You know, when we understand that from the Philippians perspective, we cut walk away. We say, wow, it's a great thing to have a man of God on your side. It is a privilege, it is a great thing to have a man of God on your side. <clears throat> the Bible says in James 5, confess your faults one another and pray for one another. They may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The, pre- fervent, effect- the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You know, it's a good thing when you got a man of God praying for you. When you got a man of God who's longing after you in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And I mean, I know I've benefited from that. I know I've benefited from the men of God and the brethren also in my life. Not just preachers, not just pastors, but even just, you know, the seasoned saints, those that have lived the life, those that have walked with the Lord and been praying for me and been patient with me and guided me. That, that's a privilege. You know, that's something that, that we should not take for granted. <clears throat> but from Paul's perspective, and really we could apply this to ourselves as well, Looking at this from Paul's perspective, looking at the fact that he is confident that God is going to perform the work in them because he has them in his heart, because he has them, uh, because they are partakers of his grace, and because of the fact that, uh, you know, he longs after them. When we look at that from Paul's perspective, what we understand is that the world cannot take from us the things that matter most. Because you have to remember, where is Paul writing this from? He's writing this from prison. And you'll see that more in, in this chapter and, and, and later on. But Paul's writing this from prison. I mean, he's got nothing. <laughs> you know, he's, he's bound. And what he, but here he is rejoicing over the Philippian people. I mean, that's not what he said in the beginning. I thank God upon every remembrance of you, always and every remembrance of mine, um, remembrance of mine for you all, making requests with joy. He's not just in jail like, oh, I guess I better pray for the Philippians. Get this over with. Get this prayer list done. Yeah, the Philippians and the Corinthians. And... No, when he prayed for the Philippians, there was joy. And what that shows us from Paul's perspective is that the world cannot take from us the things that matter most in this life. Our spiritual fruit will remain for eternity. You know, we can apply that to ourselves. You know, the people that we win to Christ, that's permanent. That's eternity. And no matter how hard life gets or what, how bad the world gets, the persecution that may or may not come, whatever they take, if we find ourselves like Paul one day, bound for Christ's sake in a cell, we can look back and say, well, I know I got so-and-so saved, and I know I got so-and-so saved, and I got that guy saved, and I could pray for these people. And I know when this is over, I'm going to see them in heaven. And that's a joy, isn't it? The world cannot take from us the things that matter most. 
I mean, they can take everything else. They can take all our material goods. They can take our lives. They can take our health. They can take our money. They wouldn't get much. <laughs> but they can't take the people we've won to Christ. They can't take the children we've raised for God. They can't take, uh, you know, all the things that we've done for the Lord's sake. Those are permanent things. <clears throat> you know, Paul talks about it a lot. He says in Philippians 4, Therefore, my brethren, dear beloved, I long for my joy and crown. That's what he calls them in chapter 4, verse 1. He calls them my joy and crown. That's what these people were to him. And they were a source of great joy to him. If you would, go back to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. You know, God's going to give us things that last forever. The world cannot take from us. And those are the things that matter most. Those are the things we need to focus on. It says in 1 Thessalonians, For what is our hope, our, or joy, or crown of rejoicing, are not even ye in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. What was Paul's glory and joy? What was his crown of rejoicing? It was the Thessalonian people. It was the Philippian people. It was the people he'd won and discipled to Christ. You know, it's, it's amazing. When you, when you get somebody saved, you see that person come out to church, they get baptized, they start living for the Lord. I mean, every time you see that person, how could that not put a smile on your face? How could that not remind you over and over again of the fact that no matter how hard life is, the things that matter most are right there with the brotherhood. I mean, it's, you walk in, oh, I'm having a bad day, but here's this guy that we reached. Here's this soul that we saved. You know, I remember I preached to him. Look at him go now. <laughs> That's what Paul's saying about these people. I, I'm looking at the Thessalonians. I'm thinking about the Philippians. I'm saying, you're my crown of rejoicing. I'm sitting here in jail with a smile on my face because of you. Look at John chapter 15, verse 16. He said, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chose you, chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. You say, well, I want that. I want what Paul has. I want that source of joy. I want that crown of rejoicing. Oh, yeah? Okay. Well, you know what Paul did? He went. He went. Paul didn't sit in Jerusalem and say, Come to me, Thessalonians. Come to me, all you of Philippi. You know, just walk down this altar. Just come down the aisle. I'll be right here waiting for you. No, he went. And isn't that the formula? Jesus said, He's ordained us in, in that what? That ye should go. Go. And people, they, they live a joyless Christian life. And there are churches, I'm telling you, you can walk into churches, there's no joy. They're dead. And they're joyless. You know why? Because they don't go. Because they won't go. And they'll never be able to say what Paul said of anybody. That's my crown of rejoicing. If you don't go. So we see, secondly here tonight, that the relationship between Paul and the Philippians was what? It was mutually beneficial. The Philippians, they benefited from the fact that they had the care of a man of God who was going to preach to them and, and write to them the things that were needful, and that was going to pray for them and encourage them and so on and so forth. They benefited from his prayer and his preaching, but Paul, you know, he also benefited from uh, the Philippians, right? He rejoiced over the Philippians. At every thought of them, he said. You know, and that's emphasized by the fact that his thoughts were all he had. <laughs> Except maybe some chains or some rags or whatever else he was allowed to have. But he, Paul, rejoiced over the Philippians at every thought of them. And he prayed for them, right? And I want to look just real quick here at the end uh, at the substance of Paul's prayers for the Philippians. I mean, if Paul is saying, look, uh, he, has, he thinks as God upon every man's view, always in every prayer of mine may, for you all, making all requests with joy. So Paul's saying, hey, I'm praying for you. Okay, well, what is he, what is, but what is Paul praying? What is the substance of that prayer? He says in verse 9, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more, and in more knowledge and in all judgment. Don't judge. Well, Paul prayed that we would judge, <laughs> that we would, we would abound in judgment. Look at verse 10, that you may approve the things that are excellent, 
they may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ under the glory and praise of God. So the substance of Paul's prayer, right? He's praying that their knowledge would increase, right? That they would, their love would abound more and more in all knowledge and all judgment, that they would approve the things that are excellent. This is what he's getting down and praying to God for. God, help the Philippians that their love would abound. God, help them to abound more and more in knowledge and in judgment. Help them to approve the things that are excellent. Help them to be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. This is the substance of his prayer. <clears throat> so what we see from the substance of Paul's prayer is the fact that he cares more for their spiritual well-being than for their earthly comfort. He didn't say, bless them with you know, a big bankroll and a big house and make sure they don't ever have any trouble. Make sure life's just a you know, smooth sailing for them, Lord. That's not what he prayed. He prayed that they would have wisdom and discernment over decadence and wealth. That's what he prayed for them. That they would have discernment, that they would have wisdom. He prayed that they would have sincerity and purity over security and possessions. That was what Paul prayed. And Paul paid, cared more for the Philippians' spiritual well-being than their earthly physical comfort. And that, goes con that's, that is contrary to what we see in a lot of churches today, isn't it? The health and wealth, the prosperity preachers, so on and so forth. And, and, and in the end of Paul's prayer, and Paul always prayed to the end of the glory of God. He said that they would be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. Paul prayed to the end of the glory of God. So we can conclude by saying that if such things can be said of us, we are assured that God will be glorified and praised. If, we can, if such things can be said of us, then we can be assured that God is going to be glorified and praised by us. If we can say, yeah, we have grown in love and in knowledge and in judgment. We have learned to approve the things that are excellent. We have learned to be sincere and without offense, and un without offense till the day of Christ. We are filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. If, if God answers that prayer for us, like he answered Paul's prayer for the Philippians, if that's what can be said of us, you know what happens in the end? You're not rich. <laughs> you might not have the world's wealth. You might not be the most popular person at school. You might not be the most popular guy in the job site. You might get some looks when you go out in public. People at the door might laugh at you. I don't know. I mean, life's not going to be super easy. But you know what? In the end, God will be glorified. And that's what Paul cared about. That's why Paul prayed the way he did for these Philippians. He didn't care about their, spirit, their, their earthly comfort. He cared about their spiritual well-being to the end that God would be glorified. And, you know, just kind of a closing thought is that one day we're all going to be like Paul. In one way, at least. We're going to be bound. We're going to be restricted. We're going to be limited. Maybe not by a physical cell, but by age at the very least. You know, if we make it. Some of you I wonder about. <laughs> Just if anything, you should worry about me. <laughs> You've seen the way I drive. <laughs> right? But hey, we, we, if we live long, long enough, one day we get old enough, we're not going to be able to do the things we used, to, we used to do. You know, I used to be able to run and just jump in the back of a, of a pickup with the tailgate down, just run, just boop, jump right in the back of that pickup. Now I'd have to sit on it, swing my legs over to my side, do a Turkish get up. And they go, Ugh! right? And I'm not old. I'm not old. <laughs> you can say amen. But you know what? I, I've come to the realization, I'm old enough to know that I'm going to be older sooner than I realize. And one day all I'm going to have to look back on is what I've done now. And that's what Paul's doing here. He's in jail and he's just going back, well, I could write the Philippians, I could write the Thessalonians. You know, when he does that, when he's looking back, what's he get? Regret? Nope. Missed opportunity? Nope. Paul's looking back, and he's got a smile on his face. 
Paul's looking back, and he's got joy. You know, and if, if we do what we ought to, if our love abounds, you know, one day when we get to that point, our hearts also will rejoice. We'll be able to look back like Paul did and remember so-and-so in this church and that church. And, you know, that's important to realize now because one day that's all you'll have. I'm not saying you can't serve God when you get older. But one day, you, you know, you're going to get there and it's, you're not going to be able to do it like you used to. That's just a fact of life. So take that into account now. Take that into account now, because that's what we should want, to be able to look back with joy and not with grief. Let's go ahead and pray.